Hello, Hive Nation. Welcome back to the Hive Nation podcast. Each week, we have leading experts in personal and professional development share their journeys and expertise to help you connect, engage, grow, and evolve. This episode of the Hive Nation podcast is sponsored by Lost River Distillery, vodka crafted by hand, enjoyed by the best. Mr. Cameron Keller is our guest today, and Cam is in Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver area, and um, I have a I have a deep uh, 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 resignation with Cam. Um, I met Cam a few years ago, and Cam really uh, made an impact on my life in a very short period of time. Uh, Cam is an executive and business coach of over 25 years. Cam has developed, led, and advised programs for mental health awareness amongst individuals, youths, adults. Uh, that that It's a really broad range as to where Cam goes with that, which is an amazing uh, feat. Um, Cam has, uh, has developed psychologically healthy workplace programs mm -hmm. and has, uh, been recognized nationally for the implementation of those programs. And that will lead in really nicely to where we're going to start with today. Um, Cam is going to, we're going to talk about on, on the subject of mental health amongst workplaces. Uh, so Cam, uh, I can't thank you enough for being on the program today. Oh, Jason, it's really a pleasure. And and uh, I, too, am just so excited about Hive Nation. As as you know, you and I had conversations lead even a few years back around some of your vision and your passion to do the work that you're doing today. And so such an honor for me to participate and to be here and, and hopefully be able to make a small contribution on a topic that really is top of mind for executives and leaders, really, quite frankly, around the world today. Oh, for, for you to say you're honored to be in my presence uh, makes me blush. So thanks, Cam. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I would like to start with with exactly right there with the, that 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 healthy workplace psychologically and yeah. how and 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 what you do in your work in order to to implement that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. I mean, it, it's really broad, quite frankly. But let me begin by saying this is that. What you and your viewers and listeners would be well aware of is the real challenges that workplaces are facing today in recruiting and retaining good talent. And we've got, you know, clients of mine in all kinds of sectors, and I would imagine people you encounter as well are, are dealing with this issue and trying to figure out what is it going to take. And one of the interesting things, uh, Jason, is that I've really come to believe that if we are going to become employers of choice, employers that can recruit and retain A players throughout, paying attention to the whole psychological health and safety aspect of the workplace is a has got to be a top priority. And it's got to be more than lip service. Workplaces have got to make investments, they've got to make commitments, and they've really got to pay attention to this part of the work. Uh, you couldn't have said that any better. And I, I think we've all ran across places where it's very toxic and it's mm -hmm. very, uh, it's a very not fun place to go to work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I feel sorry for those places or those people that have to drive to those places every day and wake up every morning and say to themselves, Oh, I have to go to this place. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And I mean, of course, there's a range of reasons why workplaces become unhealthy. But if we can find ways to really tune into people in really authentic and meaningful ways. And, and you know, it's interesting, Jason, because another thought that's just coming to my mind is when we teach our workshops and we've got all kinds of half day, full day workshops we teach on these very topics. 
there's this interesting thing that I'll do is I'll stop partway through the, the day and I'll say to the group, I'll say, you know, isn't it interesting that I could sort of take that mental health lens off of everything we're talking about? And in some ways, we're actually just talking about good leadership. And so good leaders breed good, healthy workplaces. And so makes a good leader today, well, there's a whole range of things, but I, I really believe that having emotional intelligence, having an ability to tap into people, people are more than just workers, right? And this idea that we used to have in workplaces that you leave your personal stuff at home, you know, you tie a neat little bow on it, you leave it on your kitchen counter, you come to work and you compartmentalize and you just perform at the highest level, that doesn't work. And all the research which actually bears that out, including some research we've been able to do right here in Canada. Um, but it's about leading well and paying attention to the wellness of people. So with that in mind, how would you, how would you, um, how would you implement that to a leader and have them take what you have, have developed and take it to the next level for their team? Sure, sure. Well, let me give you a high level overview of a typical kind of a process with our best clients. So our best clients, Jason, recognize we have to address this systemically. And our reality is, is although we've made a lot of significant strides in the Canadian context with respect to raising awareness around mental health, reducing stigma, et cetera, we have a long way to go. The first step is educating people, right? By in doing that, what we prioritize is we want to one, increase mental health literacy, because by and large, people in workplaces, unless they've been exposed to their own mental health treatment, have low mental health literacy. Secondly, we want to reduce stigma, because the reality is, even though, you know, and you and I would notice with younger people, you know, people that are in high school in their early 20s talk much more openly about mental health than people like you and I did back in the 70s and 80s when we grew up, we've still got a long way to go. And so if we can reduce stigma, we can create a culture where people then do the third thing we're after, which is create help seeking. So raise mental health awareness, um, reduce stigma and discrimination and promote a help seeking culture. Because here's our reality. What happens is too often, we've got somebody that's beginning to deal with challenges with respect to their mental health, but they don't get help and support early enough. You and I both know what happens related to physical health if we don't get early intervention. Okay, simple example. I go step outside today and I trip down the stairs and I break my ankle. There's a really good chance notwithstanding the challenges in our Canadian healthcare system, there's a really good chance that by midnight tonight, I've been to the hospital, I've had x-rays. <clears throat> if I need surgery, the surgery has been completed and I'm back home sleeping in my own bed tonight. But if I don't get that treatment, Jason, and a week later, finally go to the doctor, you and I both know my prognosis and my recovery, recovery journey is much, much longer. So what we know is that in Canadian workplaces, people dealing with mental health concerns are not getting the help soon enough, meaning they're going off work and off work for extended periods of time. And that's where the economic challenge comes in because it costs employers through absenteeism, presenteeism, and turnover. Those are high, high cost items. So, so we're starting, as I said, increased literacy, reduce stigma, promote help seeking. The next thing that we want to do in workplaces is we wanna to introduce to them what is known as the national standard for psychological health and safety in the workplace. Now, I want you to think about physical health for a moment. And we know that in all Canadian jurisdictions, there is legislation where we're required to comply with health and safety standards to keep people physically safe. But what about the mental health side of things? So <clears throat> back in 2011, when I was in uh, my national vice president role with the Mental Health Commission of Canada, before retiring from there and becoming a full-time consultant, 
I had the honor of implementing and launching what's called the National Standard for Psychological Health, Health and Safety in the Workplace. Um, we did that in collaboration with the CSA, the Canadian Standards Association, and BNQ, which is the French-Canadian equivalent. And that's a voluntary standard that we now have workplaces all across the country implementing. I won't get into the detail of that right now because I could spend hours doing that. But suffice it to say, it's a policy that provides direction around 13 psychosocial factors for in, 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 you know, implementing a healthy workplace. Along with that, we have a tool that we can use to assess, which is called Guarding Minds at Work. Guarding Minds at Work is a 79 question survey that we do across an organization that helps us know where their culture is along the lines of those 13 psychosocial factors. Then from there, it allows us to create all kinds of actions, which could be policy actions, training leaders, a whole range of things. Uh, but but that, in, in answer to your question around kind of where we begin, that's where we want to begin. Yeah, no, that's that it totally makes sense to me. The, the thing that, you know, you you touched on it with, like, with for guys, you are my age. Uh, mental health was always a thing that you just kind of like, uh, whenever those words came out of somebody else's mouth, you kind of just zipped it through the key away. And it. Uh, it was, it would go away on its own. Like, uh, you know, you yeah. got to suck, suck it up a little bit, right? Like that's, that's right. That's how it was. Right. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. Um, the underlying factor with mental health is that uh, it, it is underlying. That's the number one problem. Uh, if you have problems, a bad word, but that's the number one issue. And um, unless somebody wants to talk about it and is free to talk about it, it never really comes out now, does it? Well, that's the reality. And the data shows us that still, unfortunately, a very significant portion of Canadian workers say they would not disclose if they were dealing with mental health challenges in the workplace because the fear of discrimination, reprisal, uh, that they might not get selected for a promotion or advancement because of the stigma. So again, Jason, I, uh, I'm i going to talk out of both sides of my mouth because on the one side, I want to champion the fact that in Canada, we've done a lot. We've really come a long way, okay? But we have a long way to go. And of course, the pandemic, uh, you know, just negatively impacted our reality even more However, I will tell you, we were in a mental health crisis long before the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. That's our reality, but that's made things even more challenging, particularly for senior leaders. There's been this real kind of shift in the last year or two, which I'd be happy to talk about if you'd like to probe on that. Um, yeah, let 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 let's go there with that. Like, what is the shift in the in the whole mindset around, uh, you know, the mental health. Uh, yeah, so so what I've noticed is that, I mean, during the pandemic, we certainly saw the negative impact for workers. But but we, we had this reality where, you know, business owners, the CEO, the senior executives kind of held it together because they had to. And they did a great job in the vast majority of cases and they held a safe space and they they pivoted and they created work from home opportunities and they did what they needed to do to their best of their ability to support their workers now what i've seen happen and i don't know you know if you're comfortable with the the term you know post pandemic or sort of on the other side of the worst part of the pandemic we're seeing some things improving for people across the board for the most part. But now what I'm noticing is that the senior leaders dropping, they're done, they're exhausted. The CEO's coming to me and saying, Cameron, like, like you saw all that I did for my workplace in the last couple of years, I have nothing left in the tank. Now it's affecting me. Now I need two months off. And, I, and you're the only person as my coach that I ever have that I can talk to about this because I can't talk in my organization. So I have seen this trend where that senior leader is kind of needing permission right now. And so here's my message. And I want all of your listeners to hear this. It's okay not to be okay. As the business owner, as the entrepreneur, as the CEO, as the coup, as the, you know, the, the, the director of operations, whatever C-suite role you're in, it's okay not to be okay. 
what's not okay is to not do something about it. So what we love to do is we love to come into workplaces, teach a tool that teaches people how to talk about these issues, <clears throat> as well as teach them what are the actions you can take both internally within the organization as well as for yourself, for your self-care. Hive Nation, it's okay not to be okay. And trust me, uh, you know, reach out to somebody if if you do need. And if it's if it's myself or Cam, for that matter, you know, within the Hive Nation, I'm sure Cam is going to, you know, feel free to take that that call from you as well. Cam, yeah. that's, that's a great advice. I mean, that's and there's not enough people that heed that advice, unfortunately. And uh, you and I talked about that a few months ago about how you told me about like the, the leaders that were, you know, there during the pandemic and they had to keep the lights on and do the whole thing. And then post pandemic, they're like, Cam, I'm done. Like I, yeah. I'm absolutely roasted. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about a day or two after we chatted on the phone that day um, that I was having a, that same conversation with a, a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And he said those exact words. And he's like, yeah. I have no idea where to go now. Like, I, I don't even, I don't even want to, to be in that role anymore. I, I, I was there and now we have all our workers back. So, you know, what, what yeah. am I supposed to yeah. do? Right. And well, so exactly. it, it was, it was great to hear those words out of your mouth and, and, you know, that, that whole, that, that whole stigma around that, how, you know, we don't really think about the people who, who are upfront leading uh, they are never seen as the the weak link, I guess, if you want to call it that. It's always everybody else down the down the chain. But yet, you know, at times that link can get obviously tarnished a little bit throughout. And yeah, it's we have to reach out, right? That's all there is to it. Well, and yes, and and what I get to see, Jason, which is quite rewarding, is when that senior leader does actually talk a little more openly with their team. And, and I'm not suggesting that as the CEO, you need to go into an executive meeting and start sharing all your deep, dark secrets. But if you're struggling and you are willing to talk openly and share from a place of vulnerability with your team and model for them help seeking behavior, what I notice it does it is, is actually brings that team together and it creates that, that harmony and that joint social support within a workplace, mm -hmm. right? We spend more time interacting with our workplace colleagues than anybody else in our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where we can get our very best social support. So employers have not only an opportunity, but they have a responsibility to create a supportive work environment. And Jason, I'm not talking about like doing group therapy every day, right? But one of the things we do in our training is we do work with leaders around developing that emotional intelligence around how do you just connect mm -hmm. in a meaningful, authentic way and have a real conversation and then know where to kind of like refer <clears throat> if somebody is needing to get some outside help. When do you involve the HR department? When do you involve maybe another leader within the organization? And, and how do you then support that person? Um, and, and there's tremendous opportunities for leaders to develop. And that's also some of the work we get to do, which is very exciting because that's the real game changer at the end of the day. Once you've reduced the stigma, once you've increased the literacy, now you develop your leaders to be able to have really meaningful dialogue um, in an authentic way and, and learn how to do empathy. Now, now it's a game changer. And when we see that happen, those people never want to leave that workplace because they're connected. Sure. I, I like that. Uh, and a lot of the times, like uh, the C-suite uh, group are, are really afraid to, to share some of their um, their existing or their 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 um, troubles, you know, within that within that group. But and like you said, you don't have to you don't have to deep dive. But, you know, I think if you just are willing to share just a little bit, that yeah. whole group will yeah. see, will see you as you know. Well, this guy isn't just uh, you know the CEO. He's maybe a little bit vulnerable, just like we are. Like he's just one yeah. of us, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, you made me think of something uh, that I want to add to when you did kind of validate that piece around 
uh, you know, people in our cohort not talking about these things. So it wasn't long ago I was doing a five day training for the RCMP. And it was a, a five day training on road to mental readiness where we teach mental toughness. And I was doing what's called the train the trainer model where I was teaching senior leaders to roll this out to their their sworn in civilian members across the country. One of the gals in my training was in a younger you know, cohort and she came in uh, one of the mornings and she said, I talked to my father last night. My father's a retired RCMP uh, officer. And I told her about this training and what we were talking about, mental toughness, mental wellness, the mental health continuum, you know, how brain science leads us to teaching us coping strategies, et cetera. And he told her, he said, if I had ever brought that up 30 years ago, I would have been so criticized and maligned in the organization. He said, I can't believe you are in a five-day training course on that topic. We've had, so again, we've done a lot. We've had a huge shift in workplace cultures in a positive way, and we have a long way to go. The positive shift is a good start. Let's face it. Like, I mean, we have to start somewhere. I get it. And it's a marathon, right? Not a yeah. sprint. Yeah. So, uh, you know, let's let's start the marathon at mile one. Like, that's what we kind of have to do. You bet. And it can be a multi-year process for some of our clients, especially larger organizations, right? To really embed that culture of psychological health and safety. Because it is, you know, I'm just scratching the surface of it, right? I mean, the... Because the way in which we do it, teaching mental toughness, teaching coping strategies from brain science, helping people understand and self-assess. We give them a tool that actually allows them to self-assess and for them to be sort of assessing and, uh, and, and watching what's happening in their workplace where we show them that they actually understand this. You don't have to be a psychiatrist, a psychologist to understand. And that's one of the exciting tools as well. It's one of my favorite tools to teach. I would think that it's, you know, it's not just the 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 scratching the surface, as you put it, but the scratch the surface would now lead to the next layer of of the the training or the the ongoing training, I guess, if you would want to call it not just year one, year two, year three, it might be just like with the turnover that that some some companies might have that yeah. it's, it'd be ongoing, right? It would be like a I'm not, I don't know if it'd be an every six month thing or every year thing or whatever that number is. I don't know what that, that magic number is, Cam, but you'd maybe be able to tell me, but um, you know, it would be uh, more of a, you know, an ongoing type of, of training. Yeah, it, it is in a couple of ways. I mean, we do, you know, obviously it does take time to get people through all of the aspects. Um, but then we do what we, we want to do, what we call booster sessions to be reminding people about key elements But then also there's the reality of if you want to create this culture, you need to put this kind of training in your onboarding, right? When you bring new staff on, we need to go, because your your typical thing is this, Jason, your typical thing is, you know, in a letter of employment, there's that little obligatory line, right? That says something about, and you have access to an extended health plan, but it's never really explained to a person that included in that is you can actually see a psychologist or a counselor, or a marriage and family therapist, and we're going to reimburse you, right? And they're given the little, you know, for some reason, the brochure is always yellow and white. I don't know why, but it's yellow and white. And what do people do? They go home and they throw it out. And then in workplaces, what I see is you got that, you you know, you got that brochure. And for some reason, it's always pinned in the bottom left-hand corner of the bulletin board in the staff room. I don't know what it is, Jason. Uh, It's everywhere I go, (laughs) everywhere I go. In the lunchroom, it's that obligatory brochure that's 15 years old that hasn't even been updated, and it's pinned in with tax, you know, in the bottom left-hand corner. That's just that's just what happens, yep. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, and and people don't talk about these things. So what we need to do is in our onboarding, we need to do a fulsome job of teaching the language of mental health. What what is a psychological healthy workplace? What are your responsibilities as an employee? in terms of our range of policies that link to this. And, and, you know, my favorite thing is really the mental health continuum. And I'd like to speak about that for a moment, if that's okay. Because it wasn't that long ago, Jason, where, I mean, our reality was, is what did we do with people with serious mental health problems? What did we do? Brushed them under the rug. 
And where did we put him? Uh, not in the front line, for sure not. We, we put him in institutions, right? Yeah. I mean, we locked people up. We held to this, what we call a medical model, right? That said, if, you know, if you're healthy and well, you're good to go, right? You can be in a workplace, you can have a relationship, you can maybe even have a family one day. But if you've got a mental health issue, our view is you can't. So we go and we lock you up in an institution. That was the old medical model. But you and I and all of the listeners in Hive Nation would know examples of people in their network that maybe live with even a fairly serious physical health issue, perhaps even a terminal disease. And yet they're living a really healthy, rich life because they're getting the right support and treatment for their condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now things can decline for them but things can get better for them. Similarly with mental health, mental health actually exists on a continuum. So what we teach is we teach a continuum that goes from green, which is healthy, all the way to red, which is ill, okay? And in between there's yellow and there's orange, okay? Reacting and injured. So healthy, reacting, injured, and ill. <clears throat> and what we actually show people is just like any of us know the, the signs and the symptoms of a cold or a flu, and you don't have to be a medical doctor to know that. Jason, if I started sniffing right now and coughing and sneezing and my eyes running and wiping my nose, you might say, wow, Cam, you look like you might be coming down with a cold. Should you take the day off? Do you need to take a break? Should we redo this podcast? Are you going to go to the doctor? And I wouldn't get mad at you and say, hey, don't get into my personal life there. That's my physical life. And you're not a medical doctor, right? So how can you say that? Similarly, just like you and I and everybody listening today knows the signs and symptoms of a cold and flu, everybody knows the signs and symptoms of poor and declining mental health. For it's sure. just that nobody's ever shown them that they know it. That's right. So we like to teach them this continuum and what the continuum is, is it's basic non-clinical language that provides a framework for conversation. And so what we see good leaders doing is actually doing mental health check-ins in workplaces, with, at team meetings, et cetera. And one of the things I'm most proud of is when I go back to corporations and businesses all across Canada where I've consulted to and taught and when I get to go back and I see a big mental health continuum posted on the wall, right? As soon as you get off the elevator on every floor in the corporate office and, and I see it posted around and people actually carry little wallet cards with it. And the whole language of the mental health continuum just becomes embedded in the culture. And we do mental health check-ins. And sometimes even at executive meetings, we're modeling and, and you know whoever's chairing that executive meeting hey, the first 10, 10 minutes of the meeting is where are you at on the continuum today? And if somebody's orange, you know, maybe the question is, hey, is there anything you need from the team today? Eh, you know, I think I'm going to be all right. I think it's just going to be a tougher day. I do have this issue I've got to deal with, um, with my mother-in-law, you know, who's ill in hospital and there is this parenting challenge, but I've got a plan to address them. I'm talking to somebody. I'll let you know, Okay but it might be somebody needs something in the workplace. But this is a really exciting tool that as I say, we, we train people to actually use. It helps them know where they are at on a continuum. And it has things to do with sleep, my physical health, my mood, my attitude, my level of performance, how much I've been using various substances, anything from caffeine to cannabis to alcohol to over-the-counter substances or whatever it might be as part of my coping. Um, so that's a really powerful thing. I know I went on a, a long time around that, but it's because it's an exciting and it's a game changer. But Cam, I guess that, that that's part of my question as well, though. So that 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 person that you said that's in the orange, how many of those people are actually going to come out and say, you know, this is this is um, this is where I'm at, and and I and I need help. How many? That's the isn't that the stigma around mental health that people are afraid to ask for that help. Well, often they are. And that's why the very starting point, as we started with in the beginning of the podcast here, was the first thing we do is increase literacy and reduce stigma. That's the first step. Always, 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 always. Okay. 
Right. So after after that person has has that increased literacy and and decreased their stigma, then they're more open to it. Is that what you, like is that how you? That's obviously... the change we get. Yes, that's the change we get to see in cultures. Jason, as we yeah. start to see that that organizations are willing to actually talk openly. I'm going to give you an example. I just spent half a day last week with a leadership group at a fire at a fire department in a municipality. This is a group I started their training like in 2013 is when I originally trained this organization. And we've been working on implementing the strategy, doing a range of things. Now now I go into these meetings and everybody's talking absolutely openly about their mental health. The first thing we did was a mental health check-in. That went on for about 45 minutes I like with that. a group of eight people, right? So once we create that culture where it's okay to not be okay and it's okay to need help, because just like if I broke my leg, I'd go to the hospital. So if my, my mental health is declining through a whole range of factors, I mean, the, the, the thing is, is that mental health is more complex often, right? In so far as if I go step out into uh, the road today and I get hit by a car and have a bunch of broken bones, I get taken to the hospital. The doctors aren't going to stand around and say, hmm, you know, maybe Cameron had this family history of weak bones. No, no. He got hit by a car, broken bones. That's what happens, yeah. right? If if I become very depressed or highly anxious, it may be associated primarily with one single event, a loss, a trauma, a challenging situation, more often than not, no, though, there's a complex interplay of factors that are biological, that are social, that are psychological, right? And so that's why it does take a bit longer because we need people to learn about what are the biological components and what can we or can't we do about it? What are the psychological components? Those things in here, the way I think, my attitudes, my beliefs. And what does brain science research teach us? Because we have a lot of research around how we can change this. And then what about the social factors, right? I'll give you a quick example. You know, every year at, at, on September 11th, of course, we all think about that tragedy, right? The year my firstborn son was born in 2001, right? 10, 10 days before I brought a child into the world. And I'm thinking, why am I starting a family? As you would expect, Jason, a very significant portion of people that were directly impacted by those events, and by directly impacted, I mean in the burning buildings or in the immediate vicinity, a, a significant portion are not doing well today. In fact, they're doing, they're doing very unwell. But there is this cohort of people that not only has bounced back with resilience and is doing well, they are actually thriving to an extent they could never have thrived if they had not been through this trauma. To the point where some psychologists want to coin a term post-traumatic growth. And what we know is there is one single thing that sets this group apart, and it is the social support they have. Typically in the form of a loving partner and family, but often well beyond. And so, we can actually teach workplaces, how do you do social support in a workplace in an appropriate supportive way, right? So again, we've got the biological, we've got the psychological, and we've got the social. We need to address all of those because it's complex. Um, I have a, a, a question that would take this conversation a little bit further. Uh, maybe to the next level, Ken, I'm, I'm, and I'm not sure if if we never really talked about this, so I'm going to throw this on you. Maybe, maybe kind of, it might be a slap in the face, but uh, not yeah, at all. We never really chatted about it that much. The use of technology today to deal with mental health and or to strengthen mental health. Do you see anything new coming down the line in the use of technology that? There's, I know there's some technology out there that is exact negative or minus uh, mental health, such as like your, your TikToks and your Instagram and all that sure, other sure, crap that, sure. that people get addicted to. But uh, is there any technology out there today that you would recommend or have you seen that would be used today as a, you know, mental health strengthening conditioning tool? 
Yeah, great, great question. And and that that topic of, of sort of the social media and technology is a broad one. Where I'll start, though, is I will say that in first answer, yes, there's all kinds of tools, right? There's 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 endless amounts of online tools for self-assessment, for support, for self-help skills, for learning. And that's really valid. But one of our biggest challenges, Jason, and, and partly why we are in a mental health crisis is we do too much of this, right? And we've lost the art of this. And so it's it's social media and technology in and of itself, while it's very good, and while there's all kinds of great things that have come from that, I'm of the view that that is one of the major contributing factors to poor and declining mental health, because we have lost the art of this. Yeah. And so, yes, technology, but I'm a real believer that wellness is, is you know, if we want to be on a journey to wellness, it's based in human connection and relationship. There is a survival code encoded on our DNA that, that makes us require human connection and attachment. And that is why the worst form of torture that exists is isolation. Okay. So yes, use technology, but don't use technology only. We all need to build a social support network. And that can include professionals, somebody like me, a coach who has an expertise in weaving in the mental health component to all the other stuff that most people call me for, which is I want to grow my business. I want to climb the ladder. I want to make more money. I want to be a higher performer. But then in the midst of that, we start realizing there's a mental health component, right? So yeah, I have a professional um, or even a clinician, but, but beyond that, other supports. Do you talk openly with your family? Do you talk openly with your friends? Do you have other people that are socially supporting you where you can connect with, right? And so yeah. this is where right at the beginning of the pandemic, when this whole social distancing thing, I started writing right away and doing workshops on no, 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 no such thing as social distancing, physical distancing. Yes. Not social distancing. Yeah. Right. We need connection. So I know that's a big, broad answer. Yes. Great technology, not technology only. It doesn't suffice. And it's the one of the major contributors as to why we have the problem we have today. Yeah, I 100% agree. And we see it a lot, obviously, within the the uh, age range, you know, as as you you split them out, 70s to 80s aren't quite as, you know, maybe addicted to this, but the, the you know, 20 to 30 year old range, they maybe just, uh, you know, came accustomed to it easier, yeah. and uh, they just grew up around it. And that may be part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Cam, we could probably talk about this for a long time. I'll be honest. This, <laughs> we could uh, go for days, my friend. We could go for days. <laughs> and I mean, there, there's so many more questions I have within technology. And and you know, we we talked about before we came on on uh, on camera here about um, the other things that you do within your business as well, including scaling business. So I, I would love to have you back uh, for our listeners who are <laughs> have that uh, scaling business type of question on their mind and and how the hell do I do it? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and obviously to have a, a guy like yourself who has taught it and experienced it and, uh, you know, been in the trenches with it, you know, I, I think Hive Nation uh, listeners would love to have you back to, to, to talk about scaling business. And then I, I would love to have you back after that again to talk back about mental health and, and where where it's it's uh, it's grown since the last time we talked today. Yeah, well, listen, it would be my pleasure. Why don't you wait and you hear from your uh your audience, if, if if they got anything from this, and if they did, you know, evaluate it first, uh, then yeah, because I mean, the reality is, is this much of what we do is all about strategy, growth, you know, leadership development, alignment of teams, taking market share and crushing the competition. This amount is on this whole, you know, psychological health and safety piece, but it's getting bigger. Um, but I just know there's, there's almost no coaches out there, Jason, that really are equipped to talk about this. So uh, that's why I was happy that you asked me because it is very much a niche. And you know, you, you, there is this whole, whole clinical field over here and then there's this business field over here. I don't know of many that know how to really bring it together into one. 
And, and it actually really is. I mean, if you really want to scale, if you really want to lead effectively, you got to be paying attention to your mental health. You got to be paying attention to the mental health of your workers. You've got to be promoting psychological health and safety through your policies, through all the 13 psychosocial factors. I mean, we could do a whole podcast on the psychosocial factors, yeah. right? We could do a whole podcast on the mental health continuum. We can do a whole podcast on what does brain science teach us about resilience and coping strategies, you know? I mean, all of those things we do full day workshops on. Then right. we could do relation our relationship series and how do you build relationship? How do you build emotional intelligence? How do you do conflict resolution? So yeah, there's a ton. Um, so, but only invite me back if you get good feedback. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm gonna go. Better. I'm just gonna go out on a limb here right now, Cam, and say this is gonna be uh, this is gonna be our most watched uh, podcast yet. Uh, this wow, this is well, that's uh, humbling. This is really on like for the age group of the people that are entering the workforce today. This is obviously like front and center, and you know, you and I both know that, and the listeners of this know that. And so the continuation of this conversation, you know, has sure. to go on, first of all, for for anything to, to move forward because of the age group of the people entering the workforce nowadays. And, yeah. you know, that's A and then B. It's the whole thing around the the mental health of the leadership group that you talked sure. about you got and it. how they can, you know, take it to the next level and, and keep that that continuum going. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about something very big and complex and and but it is there's no question it's top of mind for all everybody these days. Um and so yeah, I mean if 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 folks do want to contact me directly if it's okay with you, it's very simple vancouverexecutivecoaching.ca. vancouverexecutivecoaching.ca and uh I can be available to talk, you know, more about any of these topics. Um uh, up to you if you choose to include that as a resource. But my pleasure to come back anytime, Jason. I'm just delighted with the work that you're doing. Um, I know you have a great network. You're well regarded. Um, I'm very fond of you and, and your leadership, as you know. And I wish Hive Nation nothing but the best. And I'll look forward to being a part of this network for many, many years to come. Uh, if you'll have me. Oh, I really appreciate that, Cap. Of course, I'm going to have you. Like, uh, I, I think I'm just going to actually hand the podcast over to you because you're a way better uh, speaker and you know you you can carry yourself obviously way better. That being said, though, too, Cam, I'd be remiss to uh, not mention Greg, who's not here, who is okay. actually uh, coaching um, the next gold medalist in judo uh, currently, Fantastic. right now as we speak. Yeah, so he's Fantastic. a location... He's on location coaching the next judo gold medalist. So uh, uh, I'm very proud of him, and, and I wish I wish his his athletes the best uh, because they have one of the best coaches as well. Yeah, so. great, great work, Greg. Good for you. I know it's going well. And uh, also kudos to you for the part that you play in Hive Nation. And I know with you and Jason together, we've got a number of great years to come. So um, thanks again. Uh, Cam, uh, thank you, uh, Hive Nation. Uh, that's all for today, but look forward to our next uh, conversation with Cam and uh, the, the continuation of this. So Cam, thank you very much. Thank you.